Okay, time to dive in to some training. Now, we need to talk about a huge challenge that I think a lot of people have when it comes to... I have a dog hair in my eye. Uh Uh-oh. Can you believe it? That's not good. I'm surprised your massive lashes didn't... uh, I know. I think they caught the hair. They trapped it, which made it even more difficult. Um, Talking about every successful dog training plan and appropriate expectations and why it's so important. This is often where people really really struggle is understanding like what are appropriate expectations for your dog we have a video on the channel that talks about a puppy training schedule by age yes and uh i think a lot of people watch it and they say well i didn't find this video until my dog was 11 weeks old like what should i do now should i just start at the 11 week mark and as we mentioned in the opening you need to have appropriate expectations Mm -hmm. uh, for your puppy and a big part of that is figuring out exactly What do they know? Do you have a plan to teach them that? And what are the progressions? How are you gonna take the steps? You know, you need to set these little, you're crossing a little stream or river, you set these little stones. You're not gonna try to jump the whole thing at one time. You set these little stones to make the steps easier. It's exactly what you wanna do with your puppy training and your puppy training progressions. Something that people often struggle with, and they seem to make this mistake over and over again, using their puppy's name too much. Yes. When we, let's talk a little bit about when uh, we have a brand new puppy in the house or yeah. even when we have like a puppy over. You know, so, sometimes people will loan us their puppies to make videos or yeah. whatever. How do we... Which is always fun. Yeah, for sure. How do we deal with that situation without ruining the puppy's response to me? Yeah, we're really careful about using puppies' names when they're um, first new to us uh, because it's very easy also because we're we tend to be excited about our puppy's new name we've just chosen a name for them we want to use it you know it's great but what ends up happening is people tend to overuse the name um, too much with the puppy without actually teaching the puppy what they're supposed to do when they hear their name so if you're using their name a lot in just normal sentences like you know, spot on your bed or spot this, spot that, spot, 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 spot. You start to water the name down. So um, what we would recommend that you do is do some training with a response to name. We have some great drills and exercises to work on teaching them to respond to their name. And our expectation for our training is that we only have to say it once happily without having to have a tone to our voice and that the dogs will turn and look at us immediately. That's what we train our dogs to do. Um, Now, when we have a puppy, though, we're very aware that puppies need a lot of practice and rehearsal and training before we can expect that of them so in between the stage of first getting the puppy and them understanding the skill we will train their name but then we'll also have some filler names that we'll use um you know just in those sort of relaxed times um that's when it's like fun to come up with nicknames for your puppy or um i know a lot of uh breeders they um, will use like a pop, 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 pop sound um, with the with the puppies when they feed them. I know we do that with, with all of the dogs that we've bred in the in the past. And um, it's, uh, it's just a great way to kind of use something in the meantime to get your dog to respond to you that is not, you're not so worried about the reliability of their expectations. And then when you train the response to name, there's lots of games you can do to teach them to love their name and also though to have great reliability. Um, can you, I feel very unbalanced. Like when we look at the monitor, look at how unbalanced we are. And I feel if anyone's like really I'm front and center. Critical. Yeah, which is fine. But here, honey. Okay. That's it. Let's share. How, is that better, guys? Is that okay? Let's, what do you guys what do think, we think of that? What about the hair that's in my eye still? A little bit more balanced? Good? Okay. All right. Okay, great. Good. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, a great way to do that is to um have a secondary plan. So rather than you, like when you're using that pup, pup, pup uh, name, uh, perfect, because you're not watering down what their actual name is. Now we're going to introduce the puppy's name in a very intentional way. The beauty of something like this, and we're not just talking about response to name, we're also talking about like your recall command. Yep. We're also talking about exercising Even your puppy, like burning sit. up. sit. 100%. Like, like there's so many names that we yeah. often, you know, sit, 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 sit. Sit, yeah. hoping eventually the dog's going to respond. But you don't realize that every time you're saying a command to your dog without them doing it, simply because they don't know it yet, not because they're being naughty or anything like that. They're just inexperienced. When we over command our dogs to do something, when we actually haven't done the the training to teach it, we just end up watering the, the name down or, or sort of making the uh, chance of the dog having a great response much you know slower. It's going to take you longer because you're sort of 
erasing your listening skills accidentally. Yeah, 100%. I think that's really important mm-hmm. to remember regardless yeah. of what the command is. And again, that gets back to that first point. What do they know? Yeah. And do you have a plan for teaching them that thing? We have... I don't even know, several hundred, maybe 700, 700 videos on the channel talk about all kinds of several different hundred, aspects. 700. Yeah, all different aspects of your dog training and puppy training. And, you know, we give you step-by-step instructions on a lot of that stuff. Um, so, you know, before you try to take on the task of teaching something like the sit or whatever the skill is, think to yourself, does my puppy know this yet? And if not, if they've never, if they, if you haven't worked on it, then don't test it. You really want to be again, intentional about what you ask of them because yeah. that's how you're going to get a, a puppy who uh, has a better understanding. And it, we talk a lot about the McCann method and having a dog that wants to listen about a motivated dog. The best way to do that is to front load value on that skill. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, restraint recall, which is something that we do with every single one of our puppies and puppies that we borrow often because it's a great way to tire them out at home just before they go to bed. It's a great way, you know, sometimes we'll be like, uh oh, I don't think the puppy's pooped and it's almost bedtime. Do some restraint recalls, take the puppy outside or take the puppy to wherever they need to go. And it's a great way to, to, uh, to get that, uh, the process moving along. Yeah. But I want to show you guys, if you're not familiar with the restrained recall or how to do it, I want to show you guys really quickly uh, an example of what it is because this is the skill. If When you start your training with your puppy, teaching them their name, teaching them, uh, you know, the hear, hear, hear command with an exercise like this, it uh, uh, keeps them motivated, keeps them wanting to listen, but also builds some relational value. You know, your puppy comes home and you're brand new to them. They don't know who you are. You have to show them why you're worth listening to. And a great way to do that is an exercise like this. So let's dive into this really quickly. It might start playing when we go. So you may have seen this in some of our past videos, but this is probably one of our favorite puppy exercises to do. This hallway has trained many puppies with us. And uh, one of our favorite things to do is some little restraint recalls to start teaching her her name or even a hear, hear, hear command. So I've given uh, Ken a little handful of her breakfast. I have a little handful of her breakfast as well. And we're just going to sit on either ends of the hallway and we're going to call back and forth, tire her out a little bit. Was anybody here during our Euchre Puppy Series? Teaching her about coming to us. You're going to get so much faster at this. (laughs) Good girl. So So once she eats the food. This was, I think this was literally the very first time that we did this with her. And I think it's important to note like how kind of slow and like a little unsure she is because she's like, what is this thing? So basically we're in this hallway and we're um, closed all the doors. I've sort of, I'm blocking the uh, entrance there with my feet so that she can't like go into a different room. And Ken and I just sit at the opposite ends of the hallway and we call her back and forth for cookies. And we practice this specifically in a hallway when we first begin because the puppies can't really be wrong. There's really nowhere to go except the other person there's no distractions and um, you'll notice as we keep practicing she's going to get faster and faster and more confident as she figures out what the name of the game is. I have food here I'm just gonna hide it away. I'm just gonna turn her around. Ken's gonna try and get her attention. Ready, set, Yuki! Yay! We're a good girl! Nice job, Al. Good job. Good job. All right. We also like I mean, to report- I else, just that dog is adorable. I know. She's so cute. That. She's so little. She's gigantic now. Yeah. Um, um, and again, you'll see um, a couple tips that um, you might not notice is when Ken's feeding the puppy, he's encouraging the puppy to come right up close to him. We don't feed the puppies for stopping, you know, two feet away or the, the length of our arm. We, when we practice this exercise, when we're first starting um, and we're using treats, we encourage the puppy to come right up into our bodies, get nice and nice and close to us so that the dog is being reinforced for coming in close. That way, later on in life, when we go to attach a leash or we do something like that, um, the puppy's already been counter conditioned to come in nice and close to their humans and we don't have puppies that are, you know, deking away or becoming hand shy or don't want to get their leash attached because they've had so many repetitions of um, getting cookies and treats and pets and love for coming in close. That's a good thing to remember uh, when it comes to appropriate expectations. Something like the dog being hand shy or being a little bit worried about taking the collar and people are like, oh, you know, he's 
I, I don't know, he doesn't like me or he doesn't like being picked up. Or sometimes like, they say, oh, something happened, must have happened when the breed, with, right. in the breeder or something. And that's yeah. not always the case. Sometimes puppies are just a little in- intimidated. Sure. They're a little submissive. Yep. Uh, dogs who are submissive, if we reach over them, a very common reaction is them to kind of grovel. They get down a little bit lower. Um, you know, they're a little unsure. So our goal is to help build their confidence and build them up by making it very fun to come up towards us. We want to keep our bodies very inviting, um, lean back make fun noises sometimes i'll even tap my my um my chest a little bit get my dog to jump up at me a little bit and then of course eventually as the puppy gets bigger we stop that um but when they're little we want the dogs to get coming up and nice and close and get snuggles and love because um it encourages them to want to keep doing it this is an interesting point i think it's worth uh bringing up is that uh we talk about being consistent with the dogs Uh, We talk about like, well, we don't want them jumping up on people, uh, you know, even early. But for some dogs, you might have to break some of the rules. If you have a timid, shy dog that that you really need them to sort of like come out of their shell a little bit, be a little bit more confident. We did that with Hippie Shake. Find a little bit more value. This is when we're talking about the rules before. This is when you might have to break the rules Mm -hmm. a bit. But knowing that uh, knowing that uh, it's appropriate for your dog is important. Um, If you have a wild and crazy uh, outgoing wild child of a dog then it's less you don't want them to be jumping up all over you all the time i mean maybe you can get away with it maybe a game of tug something that's engaging but you're less likely to be inviting them up to jump up on your chest or wherever but it is uh uh, it is worth noting that um we will break the rules sometimes when it's right for the dog For sure. I think it's really important to to note that, you know, one of the things that I love about dog training and also about McCann methods and how we train dogs is we know there isn't one way to train a dog. There's lots of different ways. Um, and our goal is to try to be clear and consistent. But that's something that we do in our classes yeah. is we're able to help our students read their puppies and to say, okay, your puppy's yeah. a little softer. Let's try this tactic with your puppy. It would work better. Or your puppy's a bit of a ramrod and he's very pumped and excited. We need to do this instead. So it's important to learn how to adapt to your puppy and give them the right information and understand that, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You have to be able to, there's a common consistency, of course, but then sometimes we're going to go off script a little bit if it means um, that the dog's going to have a clearer understanding of our expectations. Yeah, for sure. That is the benefit, certainly. of uh... There she is. Mary H, dropping a super sticker. We've got a few super chats and a super Yay. sticker. I'm just trying to Hi, grab. Mary one comment here if there's anything else you had to add what to are you that. looking for i just need to grab a comment what's the name you okay um so we talked about um appropriate expectations and the importance of having a plan and understanding the progressions and actually putting the work in um the next thing we're going to talk about is leadership and this is such a common word that we use amongst our dog training and i think our students really start to understand what leadership means too as they as they get a bit more involved in the training but um i think sometimes people get hung up on like leadership meaning that you have to be like super strict and you know make your dog follow rules and all of these things and yes there's some truth to that but it's also just being clear and concise and making sure that your dog is getting good information and what I mean by that is you're learning how to set your dog up to make good choices maybe that's through having um, good management skills like utilizing a crate in your house when you can't supervise your dog maybe it's um, utilizing a a house line or a leash in the house so that if they um, are prone to making errors or if they want to wander off and get into stuff we're not allowing that to happen I think sometimes what happens is with poor leadership is sort of coincides with poor management and we end up giving our dogs too much freedom and then they can sort of kind of make up their own agenda and then we're just telling them no 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 all of the time so um you know you need to have some rules for your puppy and your rules need to be consistent within other family members or people who are going to be engaging and interacting with your dog. The rules need to be the same. Um, and that really helps your dog to have a, a better understanding of what they're supposed to do because they really crave consistency. They crave black and white information. So it's important that we're able to um, do that. Um, I sort of briefly went over how to how to set your puppy up for success, but I, I think it's probably worth talking about a little bit more. Um, you know, one of the things that we often talk about with our own dog so five alive is our youngest dog he's a year old and there's been lots of problems that 
just haven't happened for us. Yeah. Um, you know, he hasn't really chewed anything. He hasn't really stolen anything off the counter. He hasn't, you know, jumped up or, you know, nipped at anybody that's come in the door, anything like that. And it's not because he happens to be this magical unicorn of a puppy that, you know, just happened to be perfect. It's because he has been always set up not to be able to rehearse those choices and to be taught to do something instead. And that's good leadership. That and is that the is essence, good leadership. That is the essence of good leadership. When Absolutely. You're, when you're not able to be training or supervising, then you're managing appropriately. Yeah, because I think sometimes people see leadership as sort of it goes hand in hand with like discipline and being firm with your totally, puppy. Yeah, yeah. And that, it's, you know, there's a small part of it that, that it is, but mostly it's about how you engage with your puppy, how um, you know, whether you uh, expect them to be respectful of you or whether you let them walk all over you or jump all over you or, you know, just do whatever they want. Are you a strong and fair leader? And again, it's not about being mean or nasty. It's just about having a clear expectation and not getting mad um, and showing your dog what you want them to do. So to give you a specific example, you know, I said five hasn't really like jumped up or nipped at anybody who's come in the door because every time somebody's come to our house, Five has either been in his crate. So actually, it literally did this today. Um, oh, yeah. Because we had a guy come in to do something in the house. And um, when he came in, uh, he knocked on the door. The very first thing that I did, because I didn't, I had a bunch of dogs out and I didn't want to be dealing with the puppy. I just told uh, five in your crate. I put the crate, he put him in the crate, shut the door. The other uh, one dog that was loose at the time, I told him just to go and lie down for a second. And then I opened the door. So I was giving my dogs a job to do rather than let them rehearse. There's been other times where I haven't put the puppy away and I've had him on a leash and I've had some treats with me. And when somebody stepped in the door, I just reward him for sitting. So I show him in this circumstance, buddy, this is what I want you to do. What I don't want to do is just leave him to his own devices and let him rehearse running up and making an error. And now I have to tell him he's wrong when I could have given him more more information, better yeah. information, yeah. and then let him be um, successful. So, you know, being a, a strong leader for your dog is knowing what your expectation is, knowing what your rules are, and then actually understanding what you should do about them. And we don't expect you guys to really know how to do this. The, you know, being a strong leader for your dog is probably the number one thing that people struggle with. And once they figure that out, then the walking improves, the recall improves. It's, it's, so it's, it's like it's the overarching thing. Yeah. And then once that gets better, you're a way to the races with the training. That The biggest issue is that people don't know how to build relationship or, or be a good leader for their dog. And it's the hardest thing and people don't and, think that it's that important. The reality is, I mean, we give you the most boiled down version of yeah. what each of these things are here on YouTube because we want to help the most amount of people, the biggest, largest amount of people. Yeah. When we get into things like our online training or our in-class training, that's when we can get much more refined to the specific to your dog. Yeah. But um, leadership, it, the essence of leadership is good management when you can't supervise and great, uh, you know, great training, good, good choices in your training that allow the dog to stay motivated, that don't let them fail over and over again. But that, that is the essence of great leadership. So as you're making choices, if you're not sure what the right answer is, think to yourself, do I need to be managing? Do I need to be training? I definitely need to be supervising. It yeah. sort of will take care of you in most situations. Now, we've had a couple great super chat uh, from Allison Sampson asking, uh, hi, 10 weeks old Chi Chi. He's so small, I have to get down on the ground. How do I get him to focus and stop jumping into my lap and or arms? Yeah, it can be challenging training really, really tiny dogs. We have a little toy poodle named Hippie Shake. And when we first brought her home, she could almost fit in my hand. She was so, yeah. so tiny. So cute. So cute. She was like a little fluff ball with like a tiny little nose. It was so cute. Um, so yes, when the puppies are that small, it can be helpful to get down on the ground uh, to do your training. Um, but I would recommend making sure that you have, you know, a, a well-fit collar and a leash, small in size, so you don't weigh the poor little puppy down. And um, you might even just tuck that leash or line underneath your knee or underneath your, um, your foot so that the puppy can't actually successfully jump up. And I would take some time just with some treats in your hand just put, uh, practicing on teaching your puppy simply to sit in front of you for a reward. Once your puppy realizes that sitting is going to earn treats and reward, that will start to become more of the default behavior um, rather than jumping right now. 
Jumping is what your puppy finds more valuable. It's fun to do. It's and you know it's easy to do. Um, so I would uh, prevent it by using the leash and reward an alternative behavior by working on something like sit instead. That would be a great way to uh, to start yourself off. So creative Cindy with a super chat um, asks Dan, our dog's not coming inside when called. He starts to run like we're playing, do we uh, go out and get him? Or, I love this question because this goes back to the appropriate expectations yep. idea. This and is leadership. really great. And, <laughs> and leadership, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if your dog is not coming outside when called and um, he is, um, what? Not coming inside when called. Oh, what did I say? Outside. Oh, <laughs> I mean. that. Was, Either way, it's the same, yeah. it's the same problem. I mean, that really doesn't make any sense, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it's starting to turn into a bit of a game is just kind of what it sounds like. It's very common. Um, yep, it is very common. Um, so what your puppy's telling you is that he's really not ready, or what he's, your dog's telling you, he's really not ready to be outside with the freedom of being able to have a choice as to whether he listens or doesn't listen or come when he's called or not come when he's called. If he had a little bit more training and understood that the recall was a valuable thing and that he wanted to come in and he understood he had to listen, that point that's the point where you can start to give your – your dog a little bit more freedom but that sometimes takes a few months to accomplish so what I would suggest that you do is when you go to take your dog outside I would put him on either a six foot leash or even a long line it could even be 20 25 feet and I would go out with your dog I wouldn't at this point send your dog outside and stay yeah. inside and I know that's super convenient and I know for us it's the colder weather's coming super inconvenient yeah super inconvenient yeah. I don't know. I'm saying everything opposite but whatever um you need to go outside with your dog so that when when you call them, you can then teach your puppy to respond. Yeah. You might bring out their favorite treat or their favorite toy. You might give a couple nudges on the line. And when the dog looks at you, praise, run away and get your dog to chase you. Make it fun. Make it fun yeah. so that your dog wants yeah. to come in. There's lots of rewards. But with the line on, your puppy can't run away. They can't do anything else but move towards you because you have control. That elevates yourself as a leader. It also states the rules a little bit more. Guess what, pup? There's no options here. You need to come in, but you're also doing it in a fun way rather than in a you know a disciplinary way. And also, you'll be less frustrated because you have a bit more control. Uh, from Sue K, Sue asks, "Is allowing Casey to jump on me as he returns on a recall okay? If I don't want him to jump on me, if it's uninvited, am I being unclear to the pup?" Um. So this is an interesting one. This is one of the situations where we talk about, like, we want to be, sometimes we want to break yeah, the rules. exactly. But I think Sue sounds like she's starting to establish some rules yeah. in this situation. That's sort of why I hesitated, Sue, because yeah. I kind of wanted to say yes and no. <laughs> and here's why. So um, if your dog is able to, um, say, for example, ask yourself this. If you call Casey in and he's running towards you and he gets about, like, 10 feet away and you were to say off or sit would he listen if you if the answer is yes then I would sometimes let him jump up as a reward and as he gets close I might even say hop up and I would give him permission let him jump up play with him for a second and then tell him okay off sit and then regain control yeah. if the answer is no and little Casey is just jumping on you whenever he feels like it then I would not allow that behavior as of now. So what happens is when the dogs start to listen better and more reliably, we get to pick and choose what rules we have. Um, you know, I, I giggle to myself times sometimes when people, if they were to watch me train five, for example, who I have great control over, but there are times where he looks like a crazy maniac. He's tugging crazy on the toys, jumping on me, doing all these things. Um, but it's because I'm allowing him to do that in that moment because I'm trying to reward him and get him all pumped and excited. But I know that I'm a good leader to him and if I were to say to him settle sit or off he would do it immediately and because I know I have that control I get to loosen the reins a little bit so and let him have a little bit of fun so same thing with you Sue I would just ask yourself do you think you have the control to stop it when you want to and if that's the case I think it would be okay to allow it to happen but maybe throw a little command in there so it's kind of like your idea Don Flores, I have a nine month old golden doodle, still very mouthy and nipping at me. Now that's a pretty broad statement to be able to troubleshoot. Yeah. But a few things that you want to be 
thinking about are management. So do you have control of your puppy? Are, is your puppy wearing a house line? Is your nine month old golden doodle wearing a house line? Are you using the crate appropriately? Are you putting the dog in situations where it's likely to get mouthy and nippy? Like maybe yeah. when you're playing, maybe it's rough play, maybe they're on their back. Have you ever noticed that your uh, your dog, as soon as they're on their back, it's all of a sudden bite, Or do we like have time? them up in the couch, are, exactly. around your face, in yeah. the bed? Are they sleeping in the bed? Um, yeah. If if that is the case, those are pretty simple things to fix. The other thing to think about is all of the leadership opportunities that you have in a day, and sometimes the smallest things can make a big difference with your uh, to, to to curb some of that nipping and biting. A lot of the times, you know, I, I, this isn't an answer. It's not the answer, but it's an answer. Making sure your dog has tons of physical exercise that you've like, you know, you've done all the things that they need to do so that they don't come in when they're all nippy and bitey and wild. It's a great great opportunity to like build some relationships with your dog get take off some of that edge take off some of that energy but there's also uh, several ways that we talk about like in our programs to work through some of that nipping and biting and it's hard for me to give you a specific answer for your specific dog um, you know without really knowing what their temperament is normally how your relationship is you know how, how well does your golden list uh, do to listen to you um, there's a lot of things factors that would change the information that we give so it's sort of hard mm. to address that on a YouTube comment I might suggest um, Don and maybe one of our moderators can can drop this in the chat for you if they haven't already but we recently put out um, a fabulous video it's actually a, a recording of a private lesson that I did with someone with a little yellow lab um, that was nipping and biting and I talked a lot about leadership and nipping and biting in it and I think that you would find that video really um, yeah. beneficial yeah for sure mm -hmm. Yeah. It was it was all, all out only a few weeks ago, but I'm sure one of these guys will, will drop the link in the chat. But if you go to our YouTube channel, it'll be one of the last videos because it was a pretty recent one and it was pretty good. Yeah, perfect for you, Don. Yeah. Um, from Michael. Michael Monahan. Michael asks, my 10-week-old, or says, my 10-week-old Aussie Doodle is really distracted outside... 10 week old golden Aussie doodle is really distracted outside and won't go potty unless it's on my balcony. Any advice? So he goes potty outside on walks. Now, first things first, I'd be really careful with a 10 week old puppy going out for walks, uh, you know, in a lot of places. Um, shots probably aren't up to date. Uh, I mean, I don't know where you're I would love to know walking. if you live in an apartment. Like... Plus, oh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. I just wanted to see if he if we can write anything um michael let us know in the chat if you yeah. are in an apartment and what your like outside situation is like and while you're doing that i'm gonna give you some tips here yeah um so if if the dog's going to the washroom on the balcony um going pee or poo is it the dog um is the dog like having accidents on the balcony or do you have something out there that the dog can actually go in like do you have like pee pads or like a what do you call those things um oh yeah you know what like i mean i'm grass, sure like those grassy grass area things, things. Yeah. like is that what the puppy's going to and so maybe that's the easier more comfortable option your puppy's really young too 10 weeks very very young still um so you know if it's cold outside or if there's distractions outside then that could be the easier option if that's sort of what the routine has been so far um if it's that the puppy's having accidents then that should be an easier thing to fix actually because it's not a routine um but my suggestion to you is to um, practice taking your dog outside at times of the day, most specifically the morning, when your puppy, um, he lives in an apartment, yes, um, when your puppy um, actually has to go to the bathroom. So in the morning is great. So when you get your puppy out of the crate yeah. and they need to go for their first morning pee, that's the best time to go down and have your puppy go to the bathroom outside. Find the nearest patch of grass. I might even, your puppy's only 10 weeks old, I might even carry my puppy yeah. all the way down to where you need to go and then place them down on the grass. Just stand still with the puppy on a leash and and wait for them to go to the washroom uh go pee or poo i know the washroom thing is very canadian and i can't not say it um so i i actually have been to fire calls before where we were we were going up and people were bringing their dogs out like in a trolley like or like you know like a little tiny wagon um, and that's how they would get the dog in and out of the apartment building Why? so that they could go out to pee i guess maybe they'd be marking on the way down or well something they can't like that. carry them I, yeah i don't know they, they weren't they weren't but oh. maybe that's an option for you maybe you can get a cool little trolley it could be like a covered I wagon think fun that thing. that's ridiculous I, I it looked like a lot of fun that's you can carry your dog or you can <laughs> teach it to walk 
the Ozzy trolley Doodle, yeah, thing is Ozzy weird. Doodle's not very big. It's a little tiny ten week old puppy. Yeah, <laughs> hold it in your arms and yeah. take it Probably outside. Probably in your shirt. Yeah, put it pop in, like, it down. St- uh, yeah, there's grass outside on the balcony. Okay, so try to make sure that you're only. I would personally only use that like in an emergency, like when I'm like ah, I can't get outside. And I need to go now. I would start to make sure that if that's the option, then your puppy's not going to want to go other places, especially if down low there's there's lots going on. So um, do the morning thing. I think that will really help. Take the puppy outside first thing in the morning for the morning pee. Set them down, praise lots, and only use the balcony thing if you absolutely have to. Uh, because what will start to happen is puppies will learn to go to the bathroom in one spot, and then they don't think that they're supposed to go anywhere else. So you need to kind of break the seal, break the break the routine. Once you're over that, then you won't need to be so specific. You can use the balcony when you want. You can take the dog out when you want. Like you don't have to be so restricted. But right now, your puppy's in a pretty critical learning phase, and I just would try to force the issue of going elsewhere until the puppy becomes more comfortable yeah the first thing in the morning we talked about that in a couple of videos yeah taking the puppy directly yeah. outside uh, from nikki willett uh our three and a half month old puppy is still peeing in his crate at night we verified the correct size crate he's a small havanese and sleeps in his crate about seven or eight hours is that too long mm. so an important thing to think about nikki is uh and actually i think that we we have a video that talks about this quite a bit that's perfect for people who are struggling with overnight crate training accidents Excuse me, but uh, your overnight uh, success for your puppy not having accidents starts at about dinner time. Mm-hmm. You're starting to plan out the rest of your night. Um, it, that can include things like reducing the amount of water intake, making sure your puppy has lots of uh, uh, opportunities to go outside, maybe a little bit of exercise to stimulate some of that. But maybe more important, most importantly, is it is the crate in a location overnight that you can hear if they start to fuss. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's makes a massive difference. Our, we have a video or two or maybe more uh, on the channel where we show like an overnight uh, crate training Process. experience for mm-hmm. the first day home and probably others that are similar amount of time. And um, uh, in a couple, in one of them, I think we you had to get up overnight. That might have been with Euchre. Yep. One of them. Even with all the preparation that we'd done and being professional dog trainers, the puppies still needed to go out. Yeah. So being able to hear that and identify, oh, they're fussing or they're whining or whatever, then it's an appropriate time to take your puppy out. I don't know where you want to pick up from there. Yeah. How many weeks is three and a half months? Uh, it'd be like 12, 12 change 14 weeks okay um yeah so still because you have a small breed dog it is possible that seven to eight hours could be a little bit too long honestly because they do have quite a small belly i I know with hippie shake the little toy poodle i I referenced earlier um she didn't sleep quite as long as like my border collies coming home because she just had a smaller butter however um another thing to take note of is um do you have any bedding in the crate because i find sometimes if puppies will have an accident in their crate and they can kind of pee on the bedding and then push it aside and then they can kind of go back to sleep and their beds like they can find a cleaner spot in the crate um, to sleep then sometimes they'll just pee because there's no natural consequence most puppies not all puppies but most puppies do not want to sleep in you know their accidents they you know they would be stressed out by that um so you might need to take the bedding out for a little bit until you can break the habit of the accidents in the crate and then you might want to minimize the time just a little bit uh until you can kind of slowly build out those seven or eight hours uh where your puppy's bladder is kind of learning to do so you know what i just realized i was just checking it on the second screen um i think we have puppy tugs in stock and it seems like every time we oh. go on live stream we don't have puppy tugs i know so if you're looking for a fun uh, toy to play with your puppy to get them engaged we talk about like appropriate expectations using some of those like fun ways to like build a relationship with your dog puppy do tug, restraint recalls puppy tug do restrain recalls yeah which the tug we didn't show a tug in that video but we do in actually we did did we publish that video already where we do the with pursuit of puppy tug? yeah yeah Check out that video. But they are in stock. So uh, check out McCandogs.store. They don't ever last long. And that's why I was so surprised when I realized uh, we definitely have some. We definitely have some in the stock room. So yeah. uh, if you're into that, if you, if you want to get a puppy tug, maybe it's a, maybe it's a fun little Christmas present for your puppy. Uh, now's the time to get them, guys, because yeah. we run out quick. Now, moving on. Uh, L- uh, Lun Channel says, or asks, oops. Oh, no, I think I lost it. Let me find it one sec. Uh, asks four month old husky sometimes gets too excited when playing and goes for the bite suddenly and it hurts what do I do (laughs) 
So, what I, I mean, that's a pretty generalized question, but uh, using something like a house line, puppy house line, puppy yep. house leash is going to be helpful. Teaching um, uh, play and settle, where you teach your dog to play for just a few seconds and then stop and sit when you ask them to. Um, you need to um, you need to get ahead of the ahead of the problem. So, um, you know, if you're playing with a puppy and that usually leads to nipping and biting, it's not that you're not going to play with your puppy, but you're going to maybe play for a shorter period of time or you're going to play and then ask the puppy to settle and sit. Maybe just use some food to help your puppy to do that. Then do a short moment of play and then have them sit again. Um, you know, teaching your puppy what they need to do instead rather than, again, putting them in a situation where it's easy to nip and bite. And then, of course, like Ken said, there's going to be times where your puppy is going to get overstimulated and they're going to nip and bite and then that case you can take a hold of the leash and just lift up and and, and have the puppy uh sit um like i said there's way more way more steps than what we can go over uh right now so i would definitely check out some of our nipping videos where we can actually kind of walk you through the progressions um so you can actually see the technique of how we do things um uh, because it would be a lot more um beneficial than just what i can say here but i think that is good to get you started actually dan can you drop in the chat uh there's a video with instructor steve when he does playtime settle and sit with the golden with I don't remember what the leash, breed was. The leash, the leash, he had to lift up on the leash. Yes, it's with the golden retriever. Was it? There was nipping and biting. I thought it was with. No, uh, it was biting the leash. Oh, okay. Well, that might. I mean, that that video would probably be. It's a similar, uh, similar uh, style of video. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, that video will be helpful for you, man. Um, actually, uh, Krista, when we were training coach, we back in stock. We're actually sold out. And I was on the phone today for some time. We're looking at February, maybe early February. We're working on it. Yeah, we're working on it. They're going to be back better than ever. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, for sure. Um, Ridley Lisi, uh, four month old pit bull retriever on walks. He stops and sniffs everything. What's the best way to get him walking with me? I'm sorry. He cuddles with me every night. Well, I don't know why you're sorry about that because that's <laughs> what we're all looking for, aren't we? We talk a lot about, um, uh, you know, some ways to keep your dog engaged with you as you are starting your walking training. So at four months, I really want you to be focused on short, really great walks when you go out with your dog. A couple really easy ways to keep some of that attention back up on you is using your voice, praising your dog when they're, they're in a great position, really co encouraging them on in between things like the rewards. One of the most common reasons why people struggle and have their dog sniffing and scavenging on the floor, or on the ground when they're going for walks, is there, and I get it, like there might be so much going on, you're like, okay, leash is loose, I got my dog in on my left hand side, okay, I'm scanning the environment, away we go on, and you're not going fast enough. If you go too slowly, your dog has way too much time to investigate stuff on the ground. They have mm -hmm. way too much time to like pick up that stick. You need to find a pace that's going to work for you. Again, at four months, you're probably just starting some of that leash walking yeah. training. So keep your training sessions really short, really precise. Maybe that even means building value in your driveway, in your parking lot, mm -hmm. in the hallway, wherever you can get success. But really take a look at Am I, am, I, am I going the right speed right now with this dog? Yeah, changing direction is also a really yep. helpful tip uh, for dogs that get really sniffy because yeah. it sort of allows you to kind of get back in the driver's seat in the direction that you're going. So if they sort of sniff and go in one direction, tell them, let's go, and then literally do like a 180 degree turn and go the other direction, trying to encourage your dog to re-engage with you um, again. And then you, it also might not be a bad idea to take some treats on your walk and you know reward your dog every couple of steps as they keep their head up so they learn the good stuff comes from you rather than being able to self-reward by grabbing uh, stuff off the floor or sniffing the ground. Uh, Bonnie Craft, grabbing those puppy tugs. She, she got a couple of them, I think. Good nice. For you. Great. Um, Jess H., thank you for the super chat. After play with interaction only toys, I give bone on your bed that soon gets shoved into me repeatedly. I take it away and then he lies to not go potty. I'm not quite sure what that question is. After play with interaction only toys... I give bone on your bed. Okay. Okay, so she's playing with the puppy, then she gives the bone on the bed, okay. but then rather than going and lying on the bed, the puppy just shoves it at her to play with him. I take it away, and then he... I don't know what the last part means. Well, I can talk about the first part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not a bad thing that your puppy wants to re-engage with you, uh, for sure. I think that that's actually really nice if you go from interacting with your puppy to wanting them to kind of do their own thing. But it could be that it's challenging to go from one to the next. So you might... Um, 
avoid doing them back to back. So rather than playing with a puppy and then saying all of a sudden, okay, go do your own thing, you might start by letting him chew on the bone and then bring, you know, ask for engagement after afterwards. Or you might do something that calms your puppy's brain down a bit more. So after I play around with my puppy, rather than just having them go and disengage and do their own thing, I might get a few treats out and do like some sits or some tricks or something that's calmer just to kind of get the dog settled a bit more. And then I might go and have my puppy lie on the bed to chew the bone. I might even have them go on the bed and, um, you know, chew a Kong or, have, you know, get peanut butter out of a Kong or something that keeps the puppy a little bit more engaged yeah. and not so apt to just turn and, and come back towards you. Um, or you could even throw them in the crate for a few minutes, not in a disciplinary way, just in a, okay, bud, that was fun. Okay, go for a nap. And then let him, you know, go in his crate for a little bit and then bring him out a little bit later. But um, hopefully there's a few tips there that that can help you. Uh, Yeah, I I think um, it's so important to balance out that like physical play and interaction with like a job. Okay, now you're kind of like excited and you're in a very malleable, very workable state. Now go lie down in your bed or like sit in sit in control position at my side. Do something that requires a little bit of uh, self-control because one of the rules when it comes to a great puppy training plan includes impulse control exercises. Yes. Now, uh, you may have seen this. We've done this a lot uh, uh, on different videos, but you would be amazed. And it's funny um, when we're writing, when I was writing out this teaching plan uh, for tonight, um, I, re- I recently saw a video of Five Alive Kills because it's his birthday yesterday. And we've been looking at old videos. And I saw one video where Kale had worked uh, tugging out and then he was in a sit and she literally waved it in front of his face. Mm -hmm. I could even like drape it on his face without him touching it. But you didn't, that's not where you started. No. Like you don't start (laughs) there. So let's talk about a couple of simple impulse control exercises that anybody can do with a puppy or a young dog in training at home that will, guys, this is the stuff that unlocks that great dog, that very, the dog that loves to learn. It's the little bits and pieces just like this. So let's talk about, you know, a couple of uh, impulse control exercises. I have an idea. Okay. What if we went to the train station? Oh, okay. Do we have a dog down here? We have five dogs down here. Okay, all right. One of which would love to okay. demonstrate something. I, I, I haven't been out uh, when, uh, when also, we came through the train station. I'm wearing my slippers because I didn't think I was going to go on camera, so nobody judge me. Yeah, we're all, oh, are you? Yeah, okay. We're all judging her. Everyone judge her at the same time. That way she'll really <laughs> she'll really be judged. <laughs> okay, well, it's been a while since we... Do you use food or toys? It's up to you. Up to you. I'll use food because I think that's what most people okay. do. Okay. Well, you know what, guys? It's a special night. We haven't gone over to the train station in some time. And uh, tonight is the perfect night. Let me set this up a little bit. Okay. It's time to head on over to the train station. Lights, camera, action. Um, Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about an exercise that we call rule outs. And this is a situation where we teach our dogs that if they show us self-control, they'll end up getting what they really want. So if I was to take this food and just, you know, put it right near Hippie, her instinct is to just grab the food right away. And I would be sure that your puppies do the same thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the food and I'm going to take a piece of of it and I'm going to close it in my hand and I'm going to offer it to my puppy. Now, because my hand is closed, she can't actually actually steal it. If she tries to go for the food, I'm going to keep my hand in a fist. The moment she stops trying to steal the food from me, I'm going to open my hand. Now, this exercise, she's going to do well at this because she's trained to do it already, but I will explain all of the different options. Um, If I open my hand, what a lot of untrained dogs will do, as you could probably guess, is they go to grab the food. They're like, oh, there's the treat, I'm gonna grab it. And what you're gonna do is quickly close your hand before they can grab it. When the puppy backs off, you're going to open it. If they go for it, close it. As they stop going for it, open it. And the goal is to get to the point where she figures out every time I try to snatch that food, it disappears and I can't. But when I back off, it reappears. So when I'm able to finally do this, Yes. So do you see that? She went to go sniff it and I just closed my hand really quickly. The next time she pulled her head away and I said yes and I gave it to her. So try, 
Yes, good girl. When she uh, pulls herself away from grabbing the treat, I'm going to then, <laughs> she's going to try and do tricks for me here. I'm going to then reward. Good girl. Yes. Now, you can make this a much more challenging for your dog um, as they start to understand it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put some food on the floor and I'm going to just cover it with my hand. Now, a lot of people do this with their exercise, with their puppies, but they tell the dog, leave it. And you can do that. But what I'm trying to do here is let Hippie kind of decide her own fate. So I'm actually not going to tell her to leave it. I'm just going to put the food on the floor and I'm going to put my hand over it. Good girl. Good. Now that she's not trying for it, I'm going to expose the food. Yes. And I'm going to reward her. Yes. For not grabbing it. Yes. Good girl. Now, she did really awesome. When you first try that, sometimes what happens is you put the food out and they just go to grab it right away. So again, I'm going to put the food out. I'm going to cover it. Come here so the camera can see you. Okay, she's not trying for it, so I'm going to expose it. Oh, if she tries to grab it, I'm going to put my hand over it again. I'm going to expose it. Yes, and reward. Now, do you see how I'm moving the food to Hippie? I'm not letting her go forward. Yes, and then reward. What if I put it closer? So she goes to go for it. I'm going to cover it. Yes, good girl. What if I put it closer? Oh, you little sneaker. That was naughtiest girl. Oh, I beat you to it. Yes, hippie shake. Good. Yes. Okay, get it. Yay! Okay, okay, okay. It's not your turn. Um, you see sort of how that works. You can do the same thing with the toy. So it's a very simple exercise, but this type of le thing leads to teaching her not to sniff the floor. I think somebody with the, with the pit bull um, dog was asking about that. It also teaches her to have more manners around food. If I put a, you know, a bowl of popcorn down on the coffee table, you know, she understands. I just don't grab things whenever I want to. I have to show a bit of manners. And this is a really great way to show some self-control. This type of rule out can be used in many uh, other circumstances, but this is a great game to start off to help teach your dog kind of how to play it. Good girl, hippie shake. Hey, that's it, hon. Yes. Okay. Thumbs up if you think Hippie was the cutest, cutest He's demonstration so dog cute. with that little tail. I'm surprised she wasn't hovering. Uh, <laughs> so cute. Now, uh, Hippie is pretty successful. When you're doing this with your dog, it's probably going to take you four times as long, but you're following precisely the same steps. And these are the little exercises that all of a sudden you're like, geez, you know what? My dog's checking in with me a little bit more often. Boy, they're listening more now. And this exercise has nothing to do with your leash walking. This exercise has nothing to do with your recall, but these little bits, these are how you really strengthen that relationship so that your dog wants to listen. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when I was a student, because I started just like you, I, had a, I was a frustrated dog owner, I had this wild and crazy dog, I eventually went to McCann Dogs and I saw, I was skeptical about how, okay, well how can that exercise help me with my sit stay? You'd be shocked. And it, 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 it is a very impactful thing because all these little bits and pieces make you a better dog trainer, but they also teach your dog to listen. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about that uh, exercise too is you don't really need a lot of space. You know, you just need a small little area to practice in, and it's um, it's really yeah, fun. The dogs I, I and know. the dogs do pick up a, uh, on it quickly. You just need to make sure that you have good timing. Honestly, that's the kind of thing you do. I guess there's no, I mean, nobody really has commercials, but like you know, when you get your countdown at the end of a Netflix nobody has show. Commercials anymore, um, yeah. Or, you know, maybe, maybe, some, you know, you or your Our partner. Our examples are, have are, to be updated. Are, yeah. Or like you're <laughs> choosing what you're going to watch on Netflix, which actually can sometimes take a lot longer than the show does. But that's the time when you can do exercises like that. You know, I would do, with our puppies, I would do that like at least once a day because it's so easy. And it's just a great way to like get them engaged with you. Yeah. Yeah, I really like what those What about exercises. when you're waiting for the Keurig to get your tea ready? Yeah, maybe you have a Keurig at home. I mean, we're not, not hashtag not, not sponsored, sponsored, but, you Unless know. you want to, because I really like using it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, th those moments. Those moments in your day when you go to pick up your phone, and you're like, oh, let's see what's happening on uh, Facebook or go whatever Go and train your puppy you instead. Right, because it does. it takes the same amount of time. It does. And, I mean... Putting this up front is massive. And you're not helpful. making progress by picking your phone up, but you're making progress when you train your puppy. That's right. So let's talk about the difference between proactive and reactive steps in your training. So uh, a reactive step might be um, leaving a bunch of stuff out on the floor and your puppy gets into it. Um, a reactive step might be uh, your puppy is having accidents on the floor and they sneak away again 
they go around the corner and they pee on the floor. Yeah. Those are reactive steps. And then you go get your puppy, you take them outside. Think about how you can proactively prevent some of these things. We talk a lot about crates and crate training. And actually, if you're a puppy owner and you have a, uh, uh, if you're doing crate training right now, make sure you check out this week, Saturday morning's video. It is the so perfect video cute. for you. Oh, it's very cute. But also the perfect video for you. Make sure you check that out. Um, but talking about like these proactive things that you can do. If you, if someone comes in the house, today is a great example. When we were at home, uh, someone came in the house to do some work. And the puppy, you know, Kayla's ready, but the puppy started to go crazy. So she took control of the puppy, put him in his kennel. That's a proactive step rather than like panicking and running around and asking for a sit. He, he didn't even go crazy. No, he didn't. But, <laughs> because yeah. I put him in the crate before he could. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. But, but that is, that's what we're talking about. Be proactive. He's an angel. Um, taking your puppy out, uh, you know, if you're not sure when the last time was that they went pee or if you're like, huh, I wonder if the puppy has to go pee, take them out. That's a proactive step. Effie's on. Oh, cool. Hi, Effie. Effie's the owner of the puppy that we are using in the upcoming video that is really cute. Yeah, that needs to see. very cute puppy. Very yeah. Cute. Um, other proactive steps that we have that we, we would take into account when we're training our puppy. Um, a lot of the times when we're teaching new things to the puppy, we try to, I feel like I say this a lot, but I, I just think it's important. We try to set them up to be successful. And I sort of hinted at this when I talked about the very, at the very beginning of the stream when we were talking about response to name. So when we're teaching our puppy something new, we try to set them up to be successful by proactively helping them to be right yeah. so i might start off you know brand new puppy a new exercise or maybe if i haven't practiced something in a while maybe if i'm around a lot of distractions i'm not just gonna ask my puppy to do something and hope that they listen i might give a command and then help them into position rather than you know chancing that the puppy doesn't listen that would be me being a proactive trainer that's me not giving my puppy an opportunity to make any mistakes because i'm helping them now that's not something that you need to do forever but in the early stages before you really have that reliability it's just a really smart way to go around uh, about things Absolutely. We have a super chat from Kim West. It's a dinosaur upstairs. Kim says, yeah, sounds like there's a dinosaur in the train station. Um, what would you do for a puppy that wants to nip when luring? He has no problems when stationary training. This is not uncommon. When we try to get him uh, to stop nipping while moving, he sits and then won't follow the lure. Um, I would work on teaching your puppy to take the food from you uh, gently aside from having your puppy um, move uh, because once you start to add the motion, um, puppies usually get a little bit more excited and they're a little bit more animated. So that's when the nipping is more um, apt to happen. Um, the uh, nipping, uh, uh, biting at your hands when they're trying to get food is, uh, the exercise is actually very similar to what I kind of showed you with yeah, the yeah. rule out. A little bit different, but the process is the same. Basically, you would put some food in your hand, cover it uh, up, offer it to your puppy. And if they you know, do nice behaviors like sniffing or licking or, you know, being very gentle and polite, you could say yes and then open your hand up and let your puppy take the food from you gently. If your puppy decides to nip at your hands, then you're going to, ouch, take your hand away and not allow your puppy to have the food. So your puppy goes, oh, wait a second, that behavior didn't allow me to have a reward. But if your puppy's nipping and he's still being able to successfully get the food, or if you just keep pulling it away and sort of aggravating the puppy, sometimes the puppy will um, get worse. So you want to just be clear with your information. Use a negative verbal reprimand of some sort. It could be, hey, it could be, ouch, it could be whatever you want it to be. Remove your hand and then offer your hand once again. And once the puppy's being a little bit more gentle, you can go back to the luring. The sitting thing is probably the puppy being confused because he says, well, I'm trying to go for the food. I'm excited about the food. But every time I nip you, you, you pull your hand away. So I don't really know what to do. So the sitting and the not moving is a sign of like, well, I'm not sure what to do then. So you need to really work on how to take the food gently and then maybe just lure a step or two before rewarding. Don't go for like the big, the big, the big walk. Mm -hmm. Just go a little bit at a time until the puppy's really understanding things better. From Heather Clean, uh, how, I would like to know what age I uh, do I begin to teach the heel. Now, physically, your dog's able to uh, start some very beginner uh, heel. Le uh, let's go. We call it, uh, leash walking training. At about four months, in and around the four month mark, you can start that process. But we talked a little bit at the beginning. I don't know whether you were here or not, but we talked a little bit about the beginning about your dog's um, 
level of understanding. And one of the huge mistakes that people make when it comes to leash walking training is they take a dog outside who's just not ready for that level of stimulation. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what they do. Their dog is, number one, not interested in food because there's so much stimulation outside. Number two, they just don't care about them. There's just so many fun smells, things to see, places to go, stuff to do. But they can't get any attention. We recently published a video. We've published a couple uh, on this exact same workflow um, about getting some attention on you before you leave the house, before mm -hmm. you walk out the door. That's the, when you can master that, when you can get that down, that's when you're able to start doing some of your leash walking. Uh, I wish, I wish more people would recognize that. It's a bit of a, something for you guys that are mm -hmm. here in the chat tonight. Understanding that stop worrying about the age. It is good to know that you're not walking a puppy who's not vaccinated or you're not, um, you know, uh, being too hard on a puppy who's got epiphyseal plates or growth plates aren't, you know, in the right place to do walking training. But walking comes down to a, just enough attention to get outside and to be able to be successful for a handful of steps. Maybe you're focused on getting walking, some leash walking training inside. Maybe you're getting great leash walking inside and that's just enough for you to get to that door and then add the next challenge into yeah. the equation, mm -hmm. add the outdoors into the equation. But really focus on, you know, do you have a dog? It's, it's so funny. I see so many people say like, oh yeah, uh, try this with a wild and crazy dog. Well, we wouldn't. That's just a terrible idea. Yeah. We need a dog to have enough impulse control, self-control, uh, understanding to check in with us because we're valuable. Mm -hmm. And a great way to do that is some of the exercise we talked about inside, but also a great test for that is getting to the door. Can you get some attention mm -hmm. before you leave? Yeah, and to give you like an, a reference, I would say that like fa our, our puppy Five Alive, he probably knew like 20, 30 tricks, different behaviors before he ever learned to do walking yeah um, for sure. we were doing so much relationship building and focusing and problem solving skills that uh teaching him to fetch those types of things i really focused a lot on that first because it kept his mind and his body busy so i didn't have to be going out and and walking him to get those things um and then by the time we worked on heel he was already such a good problem solver and so into learning and doing things that it was just a piece of cake to teach so um that's what we'd recommend that you do too love this audrey uh proctor training is going well but do you ever teach no yeah want to talk about this do you want me to talk about this well sure we can i mean we do we use a negative verbal reprimand in a lot of situations like ah, ah, or yeah, hey. we don't use no yeah something that marks the moment but if you are it depends what the situation is again this is so situational but it's better to give your puppy the information that gives them some guidance about what to do next. So maybe it's jumping up on something, on someone, we'll tell them off. Maybe it is going to pick something up off the floor, maybe it's going to whatever. They're distracted by something, we'll tell them leave, leave it. it. We'll be yeah. building a leave it command. So rather than saying no, we tell them what they should be doing instead before we redirect them. Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes we'll use, uh, uh, you know. Um, because we've somehow missed it and they've gotten into a situation. Yeah, but we try to be proactive. Now, there's lots of times, you know, are you going to be able to successfully, proactively prevent your dog from making mistakes, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Hell no, that is not going to happen when you have a puppy. There are going to be times when you actually need to say, no, that is not okay. You can't do that or you can't pee on the carpet or you can't do those things and then you'll need to follow through from there. Yeah. Um, so yes, of course, of course we do that. Um, but in terms of specifically the word no, we try to use other words instead, followed then by redirection or showing with the puppy, that, showing the puppy what they should be doing instead. Um, we do teach a little bit of discipline, but um, we don't usually go through that until we kind of know you and your puppy to know what kind of discipline they particular they particularly need because it is very puppy specific. Karen G, hi, we have a nine week old sheep -a doodle Thanks for the videos. How many training sessions do you do in a day? We're taking advantage of natural training ops. I love this. That's cool. actually something that I'd added to this teaching plan and I removed it because we were kind of running along here. Uh, but I feel like we're not doing enough. So how many, th this is really good mm -hmm. because I think so many people plan out their, their day for like, okay, let's do half an hour after dinner. Mm -hmm. Why don't I do 20 minutes, you know, mi middle of the morning or whatever your schedule is. Um, but how many training sessions would you say that you would do on a busy day when you can't, you know, focus just on puppy training? Um, two to three. Two to three. Okay, how long are they? Sometimes they're only five minutes. Right. Yeah. That's um, but I am also managing him 
very well in between the training sessions. So it's not like I'm only like I'm making sure he's listening and, and, you know, being respectful and all of those things and I'm giving him good information, but I actively stop my life and go and do training sessions a couple times in a day. And sometimes they're only for a few minutes at a time. And sometimes it's not even training him to do something. It's like yeah. playing with him or whatever it might be. But um, yeah, you need, you should try to do as, as, you know, as many as you can in the day, but there's also such thing as overtraining. Sometimes pup pe people are just entertaining their puppies constantly. Like they also do need to have some crate time where they go and they, you know, exit from the family and they learn to go into the other room and go to sleep and chill out and that type of thing. We don't need to be helicopter mom and watching the puppies all of the time and, you know, constantly entertaining them. There does need to be balance between the two. Otherwise, you're going to create a really needy, irritating dog. <laughs> well, so um, Karen mentioned the natural training opportunities, and I want to touch on that a little bit mm -hmm. um, because the fifth rule, the fifth thing that you want to be thinking about is uh, the three Ps. It's prepare, proofing, and practice. So prepare is the foundational stage of a training for let's say it's sit it's literally donkey and carrot treat on the nose luring the puppy into position and then rewarding without even saying the word and then it, you progress to like command lure stimulus lure reward and then you might go to a point where you're testing a little bit but i think what happens is people do a couple of days at the most of training something like name and all of a sudden they're like, well, he knows his name. He respond, you know, mm -hmm. I, I see turned that one time and that was great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, they move right on to the testing phase. Yeah. But there are so many great natural training opportunities in the course of your puppy, of your day when you're a puppy owner that I really want you to think of is like, they, I'm intentionally going to use this as a training opportunity. One of those might be letting your puppy out of their crate because your puppy showing some self-restraint in there is a great start. It, you know, I, I know so many people that are like, they'll open the door, they'll open the crate door, and the puppy comes screaming out mm -hmm. uh, uh, on top of them. Well, your puppy's not in a learning frame of mind at this point, although it's adorable and it's, you know, it can be kind of fun. Your puppy's not able to uh, be in a, they're not in a headspace where you can start the training. But when we focus on things like um, uh, preparing, proofing and practice, it gives you the steps. So you're gonna teach that skill. Let's say it is a, uh, you know, you're working on that exercise, holding your puppy in, uh, uh, closing the door if they go to charge out. There's a video we have on this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe Dan can drop it in the chat. But, um, at, and then you, you get to a, a point where you're proofing it now. And now like maybe you're opening the door with a hand on it. And then you're able to get to a point where you're practicing it. This is especially important with things like jumping up on the counters. It's especially important with things like chewing on stuff. We had a puppy in the house, it might even highlight, yep. that um, highlight was very interested. Mm -hmm. in what video, I forget what video this was called. Was it about the house line? Years ago, years ago, yeah. It was a house, well, yeah, it's exactly it. I want to talk about like the prepare proofing practice mm -hmm. with the chewing on the bag. Remember that? Yeah, but was the video about using the house line? I don't line? remember, mm -hmm. I don't remember, yeah. Anyway, talk, talk a little bit about that. Like, Highlight was really interested in the bag. How did we work through that? Like, Because that was a huge part of that was proofing and then practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you can pick the bag up. That's always an option. But that doesn't really teach your puppy anything. Yeah. That just sort of avoids it, which is okay to do sometimes. Um, but with this particular puppy, there was a, a training bag that was on the ground. And there was a bunch of toys and treats and stuff in it. And instead of coming and doing training with me, she kept leaving me to go and root through the bag and give her, you know, find herself something to reward on. So I had the leash and line on and each time she would go over to the bag, I could stop her by using the line and then redirect her back over and then I would get her to do something for me to get a reward. Now she did try to go to the bag a couple times, but she quickly realized that every time she would go to the bag, I would prevent her from doing so by using the line and then I would bring her back over and I would get her to do something for me instead, which was then how she was being reinforced and she went, oh, okay, that's not so valuable because I don't really get to go do that. But every time I engage with you, I get a reward. So I guess the reward comes from here. So, um, you know, the pro pro proactive part is making sure that you're, um, ready for those things if you don't have a leash or a line on or if you have a bunch of distractions around and your puppy is able to rehearse getting into that getting into this getting into that um they're really going to be getting mixed messages about about what you need to do so it is very very important that you're ready to work through that and, I and then don't move the bag Pr the proofing part is 
we're going to practice this while that training bag is there. There's lots of times when five was a puppy and, and I was starting to work on uh, exercises, I would initially, I would take him out and I would practice with him with none of the other dogs around. He was all by himself. And once he started to really get the idea, then I would have another one of my dogs come out and like lie on the bed, lie on their dog bed. And then I would practice my exercises so that he had to still listen to me even though that dog was there. That's called proofing. Um, that way I know that there's some reliability being built into the exercise and it's not just do it whenever you feel like it. It's do it when there's distractions, do it in this room, do it in that room. Um, you know, proofing so that there's actually reliability in, in what you're asking the puppy to do. But that takes training you have to teach them you can, that doesn't just magically happen with the puppies you actually have to do the work in order to get that level of a trained dog and you can identify some of these great situations and know what the next steps would be in your puppy training in our puppy essentials program mm -hmm. maybe briefly you can talk about what the benefits of the puppy a puppy essentials program yeah so we cover all of the basics in the puppy essentials program for sure it's for puppies that are um eight weeks to four months old um all of the typical things that you would think would be in a puppy program are there um, teaching the, res the dogs to respond to their names recalls handling confidence building all that kind of stuff however the biggest difference between um, regular programs and our program is the way in which we deliver the information we have really really easy to follow videos and we also have so much support so if you think taking a class online means that you have to kind of do it by yourself that is not the case. We have a whole team of online instructors that are answering questions, watching videos, um, you know, supporting you six days a week. We have uh, students from literally 60 countries around the world so it's a 24-hour service so if even if you're not on the same continent as us um you know you can still take classes we also do weekly live classes via zoom where we get to see you face to face and go over really great topics and you can ask questions and we can give you answers um and then you also get access to a support group where all of the other puppies that are in the program and their owners are included in so you can see other people's problems and and how we're responding to them you can see that you have the same problem problem as you know 30 other puppies and it's like okay I'm not I'm not the only one um, and we can talk about that it really is such an excellent uh, course and the good news is you can sign up anytime you don't have to wait for an opening date you can sign up immediately um, and then you can join us for class zoom class on Monday amazing now we've talked about some of the rules some of the guidelines you know what we talk, uh, my other job, I, we talk a lot of st about standard operating procedures, standard operating guidelines. These are more guidelines. When we use the term rules, they're rules uh, uh, to keep in mind. You know, they're loose rules. And if you answered you are a rule breaker uh, at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the show, you then- a rule shaker. Oh yeah, okay. Rule breaker, that, is that a song? Rule shaker. Don't you mess dun, around with me? Dun, 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 dun. I don't even know what the song is, but that I feels like a song. It is. I feel like we played it on a good dart hero. Yeah, might be. Um, a huge thank you to all of you guys who joined us here tonight. I hope to see some of you guys on the call on Monday um, if you are joining Puppy Essentials. Uh, remember, we do have those uh, puppy tugs. They're in stock. I know Amy and... Uh, I forget who, so we've got a couple of people who picked them up tonight. Bonnie and a uh, Anne actually grabbed, uh, uh, that we know, for our puppy tugs. Um, but there are some left. And uh, uh, it is probably my favorite toy. I went by the grade two class the other day. Uh, life skills too and there was a b several puppy tugs in there like people oh, were in there cool. playing with tug yeah because it's such a versatile tool and it's so much well, I fun. like how long it is I that's right yeah mm -hmm. absolutely and soft and wiggly and our puppy loves it so we think you'll love it too now do you listen to do you put music on for your dog when you leave the house drop yes or no when in the chat because I do I literally did that's today. right yeah we uh, heartbreaker that's right heartbreaker Okay. Patricia and, and Rocky and Miles. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, breaker. That's right. Um, because we we were traveling a, a few weeks ago and um, we used it when we were away. And knowing the value that it can create for the dog to make them a little bit more comfortable, it's actually something that we've been working on. Mm -hmm. Very specifically, we've collaborated with a couple of music composers and we've created music for dogs on a separate channel. Music. Uh, McCann Dogs Music is another YouTube channel, but we have four albums now specific for That's specific so cool. events. We have uh, music for dogs during thunderstorms. We actually created these really basal tones to hide uh, masks, some of the uh, rolling thunder. Beeline. That's going to be Beeline's absolutely, favorite playlist. For sure. Yeah, because it's stressful. If you have a dog, mm -hmm. remember uh, with like, it was a slice that was so bad. Mm -hmm. It's tough when you have a dog who's stressed by thunder, but maybe you just want like some ambient noise to create some environmental tones so that you're 
your dog relaxes while you're away. Maybe you're working on crate training. It's nice to get some background noise to uh, mask some of the outside sounds. Mm-hmm. It can, you know, cause the dog to get kind of not upset, but like fussy. You know, get their attention, get mm-hmm. them up on their feet. So available on. Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, basically everywhere. We also have a YouTube channel, and at the end of tonight's show, we're going to send you over there. But with no further ado, with all of the teaching, all of the talking, all of the things that we've trained with you on tonight, the rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you gonna train next? Happy training.